come back at any time, man, I'm, I'm making sure there's no unfinished business, if you know what I mean. I want to be ready. So when he comes, I'm not caught off guard as a thief in the night. And really, that's the parable that Jesus gave the disciples. We have it recorded in Matthew 24 at the end of the chapter. Jesus likens it unto two servants. One servant says, and is found faithful when his master returns, and he says, enter in, well done, good and faithful servant. And he's contrasted and compared with another servant, a wicked servant who is not ready when the Lord returns. Why is he not ready? Because he says, my master delays his coming. No hurry, no worry. And he parties on. He lives a rowdy, radical, reckless life. No hurry. There's no urgency. The Lord's not coming back in my lifetime. I'll wait towards the end, and then I'll get right with God. How many people have said that to you? How about you? Are you one like me? I always used to think, you know, while I'm on my deathbed, I'll accept the Lord. I'm going to party now. I'll accept the Lord later. (laughs) That's, uh, That's pretty risky. Why take that risk? So he's compared with this wicked servant who thinks his master is not coming. See, the one who has this hope purifies himself, we're told. Knowing that the Lord could come back at any time in my lifetime, it has a way of creating an urgency in how I live my life. So the first thing I like to say to those who scoff is, you know, The Apostle Paul thought it was in his lifetime. That's by God's design so that we would always be ready. See, I like to live my life with the understanding that the Lord could come back at any time. But I'm also as ready for the Lord's return if it's not another 10 years from now or more. I don't know. I don't think it can go on much longer, again, because the generation that sees Israel return as a nation... 1948 and subsequently 1967 will be the generation that will see the return of the Son of Man. So that's why I believe that it is this generation because, see, all the other prior generations could, prior to 1948, prior to 1967, they could never say that. So that prophecy had to be in place. See, now that Israel is in the land that God promised them, Now that Israel has returned as a nation, the leaves on the fig tree have returned to the tree as the Jews have returned to their land as God had gathered them, fulfilling a host of prophecies, not the least of which is the dry bones prophecy of Ezekiel 36, 37. I find it interesting that now there is no prophecy that has yet to be fulfilled before the rapture. Nothing has to happen. No temple has to be rebuilt. No anti... Quit trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. I mean, everybody... Barney is not the Antichrist. Sorry. He's just not. He doesn't qualify. (laughs) Neither is SpongeBob. Although I tell my boys, SpongeBob needs Jesus. (laughs) He's so lost. Quit trying to figure out who the Antichrist is because, see, the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the church is removed. This again, 1 Thessalonians. So (laughs) we're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus Christ. And so, too, am I looking for Jesus Christ. See, I want to live each day like it could be my last day here. I want to live each day like I'll take my last breath here and my first breath up there with him in the air. I can't wait. I can't wait. You know what the Apostle Paul says to the Thessalonian church after he describes the dead in Christ rising first and then we who are alive and remain are caught up? He says, therefore, encourage each other with these words. I wonder sometimes if there doesn't have to be this disenchantment, this 
uh, disappointment with our lives down here in order to turn our attention and our focus on eternal life up there. Doesn't things like the economy crashing and, you know, the world going, you know, uh, down and everything is bad and wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilence and earthquakes and diverse places. Doesn't all of that, I mean, doesn't it have a way of loosening our grip on this world and the things of this world? I wonder how many Christians, and this is not an indictment on Christians who have material wealth or possessions in this world. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not what you have, it's what has you. And has what you have come in between you and God? But I wonder if God isn't going to use what's coming ahead as a way to take and remove our hope that we've placed in those things so as to transfer it to him and put our hope in him. How about these investment portfolios that vanished overnight with the stroke of a pen and the ring of the bell on Wall Street? I think about the Proverbs that says, don't feast your eyes on wealth, for wealth certainly does have wings and flies away to heaven. (laughs) Bye-bye. Isn't that, I, I'm watching, I'm looking, I'm just going, oh, there it goes. See ya. <laughs> it's looking down on me. Told you, don't put your trust in me. Now, God will always provide, but I wonder if some of us here today have put our trust in this world and the things of this world. And now God is going to stir our nest. I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself in Exodus 19 on Thursday night because he likens himself to an eagle. It's been said that when the outlook looks bad, try the uplook. I wonder sometimes if God doesn't allow the outlook to look bad, so we will uplook. So, Again, I, I think there is an intelligent answer to every man, an answer of that hope that lies within us. I believe the return of the Lord is very cl- close. Peter, in his second epistle, really gives us a clear and concise answer, and I think maybe even gives us a glimpse into and uh, insight into what he was up against in his day. He was up against the same thing, the same scoffer, the same mocker who said, oh, everybody thought, you know, the uh, end was near. This is how you answer him. He says, first of all, chapter 3 in 2 Peter, verses 3 through 16, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, Where is this coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. If you're one who here today wonders why God allows evil and suffering to continue and wax worse, there is coming a day where he will bring an end and he will have the final word and every man will stand before him and every knee will bend before him. And every tongue will confess of him that he is Lord of lords. He is King of kings. That day is coming. Don't forget it. And this is what Peter is saying. Don't forget. They forgot this. (laughs) They think that because God allows it to continue, that it's not coming. God's judgment is coming. And I wonder sometimes, is this not the missing dynamic in much of the preaching of God's word 
in the church today.